Okay, welcome to the, our third session here. Uh, more on John Donne. This time we'll talk about John Donne's prose. I mean, he wrote. I can't. How, how do, do people have this time? Much time to write. He wrote so much. Um, and his prose is interesting. I mean, his prose is primarily, I mean, theological or polemical in nature. Uh, Essays in Divinity is probably his first important prose work, where I think, where, to my mind, he's figuring out the religious problems of his day, trying uh, for his own, for his own good, you know, trying to make sense of the world as a young man. Uh, Ignatius' conclave and pseudo martyr, as I mentioned before, these two polemics and pseudo martyr is almost impossible to read. It is so massive and pedantic and you know verbose and I uh, people assume he wrote that trying to get preferment from the king which is probably you know kind of back backfired because then the king would only have him in the church uh, Ignatius's conclave it's kind of it's kind of wickedly satirical uh, lampoon of the Jesuits and in, in parts of Unfair in many ways, of course, but but he had his own issues with the Jesuits. I think It'd be interesting if, it, and of course, the thing is with the Jesuits at that time, you know, um, because they were public enemy number one in England, uh, it's almost impossible to find any evidence, and it would it would be so interesting to find out more about uh, Dunn's relationship not only to Robert Suffolk, but to his uncle, especially Jasper uh, Haywood, who I think, became, you know, I think he had a really strong presence in, in, in Dunn's family, but no one would leave documentary evidence about that, those kinds of things. Because, you know, it was not fun being tortured as a recusant, and for priests in particular, whoa. Uh, some interesting literature available um, it's one called I can't remember who wrote it it's called God's Secret Agents it's about the, the Jesuits and you, you know and uh, you'd have a priest in a house you know saying mass or they would usually act like they were visiting from visiting noblemen from abroad but they would visit and they would hold mass for, for, for the inhabitants of the house and their servants but they had to be able to hide in a second, and they had these things called priest holes, where the priest, they would have a false wall or something in the house, and the, or in the floor, and the priest would hide there. And it, I'm not kidding, there would be maybe a six foot long, two foot by two foot passage to hide in, and they'd have to hide for days. And very often, uh, Richard Topcliffe was uh, Elizabeth's primary uh, priest hunter. They would, uh, Sometimes, if they really suspected there was a priest and they found like evidence, they'd tear the walls apart trying to find them because they they figured out they they were hiding like that, and they were horrible in, in torture. Uh, and Robert Suthel, in, in particular, um, he was so badly tortured by uh, by Topcliffe that at his trial, Suthel the only probably the only mean words he said in his life was, "Thou art a bad man," because he. Really was tor. I mean, it was horrible what they did to these men. And uh, at, just to finish the subtle story, at his execution, he uh, was dragged through the streets upside down on a cart. You know, so he was covered with mud. And they, you know, when they when they would execute, they would they would be hanged, drawn, and quartered. So they would they would hang you until you were almost dead. But they wanted you to be be a. Uh, be conscious for the rest of the pain. So before he, uh, so what would happen before you were you were hanged all the way to death? They would cut you down and disembowel you, and then cut your limbs off. So civilized, <laughs> and uh, I guess people felt so ashamed. Protestants, you know, in present, felt so ashamed. At Suthel's martyrdom, that uh, what, actually when he when he hung, he was blessing the crowd. He was giving them, he was blessing them, while he was hanging. And 
there were some men on the platform who ran over to him and pulled him down so he would die from the hanging and not feel the disembowelment. And I, I, one of the accounts I read, it gives it brought tears to my eyes the first time I read it, is that uh, one, one observer said, and you know, afterwards he said, for the rest of the day, not one of us could look the other one in the eye. They were all filled with shame. So, that, and you can imagine, Dunn, I think when that happened, he was in his early 20s, or 21, um, he would have been there, or he wouldn't, and he would have known it. He would have heard about it. And he would have felt extraordinary, extraordinary guilty. He was somebody who knew. And even if he didn't agree with him, you know he didn't want that to happen to him. And I imagine also that Dunn was present at the execution of Edmund Campion. He would have been little then, a little child. And talk about traumatic. And for a sensitive nature like John Donne, you can see why he was plunged into these theological questions. Why? Why? Why do we do these things? So I, speaking of death, uh, definitely um, Donne's most popular published works while he lived were not his poetry. Uh, but it was his sermons, and they came out regularly, and they were they were very popular. I mean, he was he was the he was at St. Paul's in London, which was the King's Church, so he was at headquarters essentially, even though Westminster Abbey was was the headquarters of of the Anglican Church. He was at the King's Church, so that was an important place, important position. Of course, he, some people felt he didn't deserve it, and that he wasn't really Anglican enough, but. But a job's a job, right? Now, but anyway, uh, another one of his works that was relatively popular while he lived was a really curious work, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. And what's interesting, among other things about this, is this is an extended meditation on death. Or we can also say a meditation on the last things. And the last things, whether you're you know, Catholic or Protestant, have a different list, but it's essentially it's sickness, death, if you're Catholic, purgatory, then uh, then judgment, right, and heaven and hell. And so, done in his scrupulosity, is very attentive to these throughout throughout. Uh, they're very often in the sermons, not always, that's not a constant theme, but it comes up often, and it's certainly in the one we'll, we'll talk about today, Death's Duel. But before that even, he wrote a book, which is a kind of a meditation on this, uh, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, and it's the curious, most curious kind of work. Um, it's kind of in the meditative tradition. I mean, each section... Uh, it's of the, the book, each chapter we could call it, is broken into three sections, a meditation, an expostulation, and a prayer. And he sticks to that form. Um, and I want to look at uh, the, the 15th to 18th um, meditations, because that, this is the heart of, of what he's doing. Actually, it's also the... A lot of people quote from these, but have never actually read the text, you know, For Whom the Bell Tolls, which uh, Hemingway used it as a title for one of his novels. Uh, but most people don't know it's from Devers Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. They, they maybe assume it's something else. Maybe, and probably they don't even know it has anything to do with John Donne. People, I mean, I remember saying this when I was a little kid, For Whom the Bell Tolls, <laughs> Tolls for Thee. I didn't know who John Donne was. But... And again, he's using paradox, but also the examination of con uh, conscience we, we talked about in the last uh, lecture. So he starts off on um, with meditation 15. Natural men have conceived a twofold use of sleep, that it is a refreshing of the body in this life, that it is a preparing of the soul for the next that it is a feast, and that it is the grace at that feast, that it is our recreation and cheers us, and it is our catechism and instructs us, 
We lie down in a hope that we shall rise the stronger. And we lie down in a knowledge that we may rise no more. Sleep is an opiate which gives us rest. But such an opiate as perchance being under it, we shall wake no more. So he gets into these curious, uh, this curious depth of his thought and his meditation on this. And the, the, the premise is that he wrote this, well, he didn't write it during, during a, an extended sickness, but it actually was during the conval convalescence from that extended sickness, where he actually thought he was going to die, you know. He didn't think he'd make it back from this one. You know. Some uh, critics assume that he, he ex suffered from typhoid as a kid and that he, he would have relapses every once in a while, which th this is, could have been one of them, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, nobody really knows. But here he is, you know, doing this kind of classical medieval meditation on sleep and death. But also here, on, in the meditation 15, or meditation 16, I should say, he takes up this theme of bells. We have a convenient author who wrote a discourse of bells when he was prisoner in Turkey. How would he have enlarged himself if he had been my fellow prisoner in this sickbed? so near to that steeple, which never ceases no more than the harmony of the spheres, but is more heard. When the Turks took Constantinople, they meddled the bells into ordnance or cannonballs. I have heard both bells and ordnance, but never have been so, so much affected with those as with these bells. I have lain near a steeple in which there are said to be more than 30 bells, in near another, where there is one so big as that the clapper is said to weigh more than 600 pounds, yet never so effective as here. Why? Because bells would ring for funerals and for the, at death. At the time, they would, there were other times as well that they used the church bells. But this is the tolling of the bell. It lets you know someone died. And he says a little farther on, and when these bells tell me that now one and now another is buried, must not I acknowledge that they have the correction due to me and pay the debt that I owe? How many men that stand in execution, if they would, they would ask for what dies that man, should hear their own faults condemned and see themselves executed by attorney? Right? These bells... And then he, he's, and, I, and he, I think right there, the ghost of Robert Suffolk comes back and says, and this is where he's saying, how many men stand at an execution? Right? And he goes on. At the end of this, uh, this meditation. So when these hourly bells tell me of so many funerals of men like me, presents, if not a desire that it may, yet a comfort whensoever a mind shall come. And then he does this very often. I, I, went, I did an inventory one time. It's quite, quite, a, quite a few. He'll start off different sections with the, the, the phrase, my God, my God, which he does in expostulation 15, 16. My God, my God, I do not expostulate with thee, but with them who dare, dare do that, who dare expostulate with thee, when in the voice of thy church thou givest allowance to this ceremony of bells at funerals. Right? So he's super <laughs> attentive to this. You know? When you're, and let's face it, he lives in, in, in the directory next to a church. And even though he, he can't perform the offices of the funerals, he is listening to this in his sickness, in his extreme sickness. That could be mine next time, right? And this is this part of this... Um, even medieval tradition of meditating on the last things. And this goes straight to the Jesuit exercises. You know? Where, where, examine your conscience now, man, for tonight you may die. And to go back to this idea of, my God, my God, what's the next thing you think of when you hear those two words? Why hast thou forsaken me? Right? 
this is the human condition. And this is what, why, and this is, this is why Dunn does this. He's, is he doing this for himself? Is this a psychological healing for him? Is this therapeutic work? No. He's a pastor. He's doing this for, for people for, to read it. So for their, it's, it, he's interested in the cura animarum, the care of souls. That's why he wrote this. And he takes his own experience as, as typical. And I mean, even though I would, most people are not, do not have John Donne's intelligence, you know, or talent, or ambition, or whatever he had, but we all partake in his mortality. And his job as a pastor is to help people not only to live, but to help them to die, to die well. And he, and he continues talking about these bells. Lord, let us not break the communion of saints and that which was intended for the advancement of it. Let not that pull us asunder from one another which was intended for the assembling of us and the militant and associating us of the triumphant church. You know, no, the militant church is the church on earth and the triumphant church is the church at the, at the second coming. For he who for whose funeral these bells ring now was at home at his journey's end yesterday. Why ring they now? A man that is a world is all the things in the world. He, he is an army, and when an army marches, the vaunt may lodge tonight, where the rear comes not till tomorrow. A man extends to his act and to his example, to that which he does and that which he teaches. So do, do those things that concern him, so do these bells. That which rung yesterday was to convey him out of the world, in his vaunt, in his soul. That which rung today was to bring him to, in his rear, in his body, to the church. And the, in this continuing of ringing after his entering is to bring him to me in the application. Where I lie, I could hear the psalm and did join with the congregation in it but I could not hear the sermon. And these latter bells are repetition sermon to me. But oh my God, my God, here again, right? Do I that have this fever need other remembrances of my mortality? Is not mine own hollow voice voice enough to pronounce that to me? Need I look upon a death's head in a ring that have one in my face? Or go for death to my neighbor's house that have him in my bosom. I mean, it's extraordinary, this meditation on his own death and the deaths of his neighbors, right? And this is why in, uh, in the 17th uh, devotion, it was probably his most quoted lines. And it, no, it, I'll just read a little bit here from the meditation. All mankind is of one author and is one volume. When one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. God employs several translators. Some pieces are translated by age, some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation. And interesting here, um, to be translated in religious language, especially Catholic language, is also to be translated into a different form, right? So not only in translation of language, so he's using it, metaphysical conceits here, right? Um, in, a, in A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare, after when the bottom turns into an ass, uh, Peter Quince, I think it is, says, bottom thou art translated. Right? He's put into a different language, you know, which is, so this is an interesting thing that Dunn's doing here. I mean, he can never, his intellect is so scintillating that he, you know, he finds these insights in places where we, most of us would not notice. Right? But, it, and, and also in this, I'll continue a little bit farther down. He says, the bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. 
and thou art interim it again. Yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God, who cast not up his eye to the sun when it rises, but who takes off his eye from a comet when it breaks out, who bends his, not his ear to any bell upon any occasion rings, but who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world. And then here's the famous line, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as a promontory were. As well as if uh, a manner of thy f friends or of thine own were, any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. Therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And this is, you know, he, this is, as he said earlier, it's a, this is a really a meditation on the communion of saints, as well as on one's own death. But also notice how he uh, uses these conceits. I mean, he uh, talks about mankind as a book, then mankind is is like a is a land or a continent, right? Little, you can't change, you can't tear out a chapter because one one part of the book is over. It doesn't. You can't change it. You can only translate it. Right? You can put it into a different language, a finer language, as he says. And no man is an island entire of itself. I am involved in mankind. Right? This is, these are the words of a pastor. Right? A shepherd of souls. And again, in the expostulation, it starts, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he can, you can see... Um, he kind of oscillates between there's despair on one pole, which he never lets himself go to, and hope on the other, where he's trying to incline himself. But he knows, as human beings, you know, especially with face with death, with uncertainty about the condition of our souls, that that's where we oscillate. You know, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I gonna, you know, what's gonna happen to me? Have I lived a good life? So, so he's doing so many different. Uh, pastoral things here, right? Pastoral actions. He's helping the reader examine his or her soul. Yeah, what about me, right? And actually, in this medita in this medita in this expostulation, he says, "My God, my God," quite a few times because it's getting close. And then just, like, you know, gosh, on the, pra the 17th prayer, for instance, he c keeps drawing on this bell imagery. He really takes this up in this middle section of the, or this section of the, of the, of the book. And really, I mean, what, talk about a meditation on, on bells. What do bells mean, these funeral bells? What's, what's, what's this telling me? What can we learn from this? You know, what, what's the, the spiritual import of this. What benefit can it do for my soul? And he says, that this bell which tolls for another before I come to ring out may take in me too. As death is the wages of sin, St. Paul, it is due to me. As death is the end of sickness, it belongs to me. And though so disobedient a servant as I may be afraid to die, yet so merciful a master as thou, I cannot be afraid to come. I cannot be afraid to come. But I am. Therefore, into thy hands, O oh my God, I commend my spirit. The words of Jesus, right? A surrender which I know thou wilt accept, whether I live or die. I mean, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> and this one, the community of saints, it's really what it's all about. Also, um,. And we live in a such a different world 
from John Donne. I mean, when Donne was sick, you know, the things that would have wiped them out, we have medication for. You know, it's a minor thing. Influenza. You know, nutrition, their nutrition was horrible compared to ours, especially in, this, in London. And he calls it, um, this is, um, Meditation 18, To every man whom I see or hear die before me, and all they are ushers to me in this school of death. Right? This is our school of death. You know, and, and they had, you know, we don't, we don't think about death at all in our culture. You know, we try to, avoid thinking about it. We don't even go, we don't even have bodies present at the funerals half the time, right? They have memorial services. Where's body? Where's body? Um, in my grandfather's day, even, when he was home in Ireland, you know, and even many parts in, in the United States, earlier in the 20th century, when someone died, you would have the, the, the wake in the house with the body in the house. We were present to death. We knew about death. We were familiar with it. It was part of our house life, right? Um, well, now we, we kind of farm it out <laughs> to funeral parlors or uh, even or in, in the case of cremation, you know, very often you don't even see the body after the person's gone. So it's like it just disappeared. But I think there's something uh, we're, we're missing that, that Dunn's age certainly had, my grandfather's age. A presence to death. It's part. It, it, we are. We are so afraid of it. You know, we try to get, stay young forever. You know? but, and so we could use a school of death. I think. So let's move from that to speaking about. I don't know if we can call it the most remarkable moment in Dunn's work, but it's got to be up there. Is Death's Duel. Now Death's Duel. He had been sick for a long time and. In 1631, you know, he, for some months he had been sick, and uh, but he, he rallied, and he wanted to go preach one more time, and he preached his own sermon, his own his own uh, funeral sermon. That's how that's how it was advertised when they sold when they sold uh, this duel as a standalone publication after he died, and it was only about not even five weeks before he died, I think. No. So, pretty uh, powerful. But here he, he comes up there. He looks like death warmed over. You know, he looks like a death's head. And there he is preaching. And it was a, a shorter sermon for him, which I meant an hour rather than two. But it's, it's you know, he went, <laughs> he went out with a bang. Let's just say that. Um, very often throughout this uh, this sermon he draws on, on the, the language of paradox again and uh, if you're, you're familiar with uh, the philosopher Jacques Derrida his one book uh, The Gift of Death you know, I think Derrida really be became you know became spiritually and psychologically close to the place where Dunn was at, at that point in his in his career. I don't see him so much early in, his, in Derrida's earlier work. But uh, this strange idea of saying the words, I am dead. How do we do that? How do you, how do you how do we? How do we stand? And that's what he was doing. He, I mean, we really are dead. You could think about it. But what is it with death? This, and he says here on uh, in in the sermon. Let me read it to you. Now, this, which is so singularly peculiar to him, that his flesh should not see corruption at his second coming, his coming to judgment shall extend to all are then alive. Their flesh shall, shall, shall not see, see corruption, because, as the Apostle says, and says it as a secret, as a mystery, 
Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not sleep, that is, not continue in the state of the dead in the grave, but we shall be all be changed. In an instant, we shall have a dissolution. And in the same instant, a re, uh, redintegration, a recompacting of body and soul. And that, that shall be truly a death and truly a resurrection. Paradox, right? How can it be both at the same time? But no sleeping, no corruption. But for us that die now and sleep in the state of the dead, we must all pass through this posthume death, this death after death. And he says in one of the holy sonnets, death thou shalt die. Nay, this death after burial, this dissolution after dissolution, this death of corruption and putrefaction, of vermiculation, or worm eating, right? And incineration, of dissolution and dispersion in and from the grave. When those bodies that have been the children of royal parents and the parents of royal children must say with Job, to corruption thou art my father, and to the worm thou art my mother and my sister. Miserable riddle, when that same worm must be my mother and my sister and myself. Miserable, now this is where it gets really weird, miserable incest, when I must be married to my mother and my sister and be both father and mother to my own mother and sister, beget and bear that worm which is all that miserable penury. When my mouth shall be filled with dust and the worm shall feed and feed sweetly upon me, when the ambitious man shall have no satisfaction, if the poorest alive tread upon him, nor the poorest receive any contentment at being made equal to princes, for they shall be equal but in dust. I mean, can you imagine watching this guy deliver this sermon? He was, he was a riveting preacher before, but now... He's basically dressed in a shroud, delivering his this oration almost from the dead himself. That's I mean, and now certainly there's a, there's an idea when this is again very foreign to us, this uh, of performance in Dunn. And his poetry is full of performances, right? Uh, it, it said that when he was a young man, he was a great frequenter of plays. So performance is a big key to, to his work. And of course, when you're a preacher, performance is a big part of the job there, right? Um, and so he's performing this, but why is he performing this? Well, again, he's performing this for the benefit of those who are li listening. Um, but as we saw in this paradox, I mean, he's just, it's so convoluted with incest and death and resurrection and all mothers and fathers I'm my mother my all this business here what's he doing well I think one one thing he's doing is he's destabilizing his audience for reliance on him um, really incredible book of literary criticism by Stanley Fish um, What's it called? The, the self, self, uh, self consuming artifacts. And the idea is that, and especially in 17th century literature, he sees it in Herbert and in Dunn, and especially in this sermon, where Stanley Fish suggests that, um, that a self consuming artifact is something that we read. And it undermines our relationship to what we're reading or seeing to the point where we can't rely on it anymore because it's thrown us back on our own selves. So in a way, Dunn is performing that kind of self-consuming artifact here where through the use of paradox and just the paradox of a living man preaching his own funeral sermon, that we are thrown back on ourselves to consider our own own condition of our souls and not rely on this a take home from from Dunn and this is how he ends um, especially I think the ending is kind of a tour de force and he talks about the death of God right God 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 died now I will die God promised a resurrection but I know I will not you know what I mean I will I will still come to corruption right. Like St. Paul says, the body is is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption, but I'm still corrupted. 
So let's get to the end of the, the sermon. Uh, it ends in a very strange way. There now hangs that sacred body upon the cross, rebaptized in his own tears and sweat, and embalmed in his own blood alive. There are those bowels of compassion, which are co so conspicuous, so manifested, so that you may see them through his wounds. There those glorious eyes grew faint in their light, and so the sun ashamed to survive them, departed with his light too. Now here's you know, drawing on the sun, sun pun again. And then this that son of God, who was never from us, and yet had now come a new way unto us in assuming our nature, delivers that soul, which was never out of his father's hands, by a new way, a voluntary emission of it into his father's hands. Right, so, right? This is the weird, I mean, it's one of the paradoxes of the Trinity. How does the the son offer the father his soul when the father already has it, right? For though to this God our Lord belong these issues of death, that's the theme here, the issues of death, so that considered in their own contract, he, he must necessarily die, yet at no breach or battery which they had made upon his sacred body issued his soul, but he miss it he gave up the ghost, and as God breathed the soul into the first Adam, so the second Adam breathed his soul into God, into the hands of God. <laughs> That's paradox. Irony. There we leave you. What? In that blessed dependency to hang upon him that hangs upon the cross. This is, we are just talking about with a self-consuming artifact. You get, you're left with nothing. Blessed dependency to hang upon him that hangs upon the cross. They're bathed in his tears. They're suck at his wounds and lie down in peace in his grave till he vouchsafe you a resurrection and an ascension into that kingdom which he hath purchased for you with the inestimable price of his incorruptible blood. Amen. Now, interesting, you know, some critics over the course of history have uh, suggested that Dunn was fleeing from medievalism or from Catholicism, you know, which is, I guess, a kind of medievalism to some people's minds. Uh, but he's not. And especially when he talks about the sucking at the wounds of Christ. This is a image that goes back to the Middle Ages. A very common uh, monastic, mystical uh, image of Christ as mother. Uh, Catherine Byam wrote a book, Christ, Jesus as Mother. Right? It's kind of a popular trope in the Middle Ages. Not popular in the early modern period, but, but Dunn was drawing on this here. And, but also, he's like he says right there. We leave you in that blessed dependency to hang upon him that hangs upon the cross. Right? No longer let, rely on me, your pastor. Right? Self-consuming artifact. This thing, this, he, he, deconstructs the whole idea of a sermon, right? Where the sermon is to give comfort, which it does give comfort in a weird way, but the comfort it gives is to no longer rely on the sermon, right? It destroys its own, our relationship to what we think we need from a sermon and leaves us someplace else, which is pretty extraordinary. He leaves us hanging, literally, right, on the cross. <laughs> it's, which is a, it's a, and also I think it's a, in, in, we remember in the devotions, we, when he's, he, he, in his scrupulosity, he's, 
he's looking to see, do I lead people? Do I have, is pride part of my, my project? You know, am I doing this because I get to be, I get to speak for God, you know? You know, is that part of my sin, my vanity in preaching God's word, right? And is it, do we use preaching as a crutch, right? Do we to rely on books or information uh, to fill up a void that's something that, you know, that's, that we're, we're afraid to acknowledge, which is, you know, we can say that void is death too, right? You know, Heidegger called, you know, called uh, being thrown towards death. You know, do we acknowledge our thrownness or do we just fill it up with hobbies or other kinds of stuff, you know, information, you know, knowledge. I know lots of stuff about lots of stuff. Or do we get, do we, do we, do we, do we acknowledge what that thrownness? And that's, I think what Don is doing, he's acknowledging the thrownness towards death. Especially, and I think really come, finally came to it in this sermon. I mean, he was certainly in a devotions upon emerging so occasion he is certainly meditating on that thrownness toward death even though he didn't have Heidegger's vocabulary uh, nevertheless that's something he's doing here and I think he's doing it through his entire career uh, but as I think of this he became a, a father a husband and then later as he became uh, responsible for the care of souls as a preacher of the gospel, you know, what can you le really leave people with? I can't leave them with relying on me. Where do I leave them? And that, I think, is where I'll leave you today. And and next time we'll get to the, we'll talk about George Herbert, who actually knew John Donne. So I'll see you then.